All right, no better place to start than at the very beginning. We're going to look at the original release of the 802.11 specification. And from there, as you recall earlier on in this course, when we talked about uh, the IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance and the relationships there, but ultimately the IEEE is releasing these specifications, 802.11 came out of a working group, and now we have different task groups which are focused on enhancing the original specification. And so some of those earliest enhancements were known as 802.11a, 802.11b, and 802.11g. At this point, these specifications are certainly considered pretty legacy, <laughs> um, but we can also usually group them together because a lot of our modern technologies were introduced in the following specifications, the ones that came after 802.11g. So in this video, we're going to unpack these four different specifications and just start to understand the differences between them. Well, as mentioned earlier, the IEEE is going to create a working group when they want a new standard. And they created a working group a long time ago called the 802.11 working group. Now, fast forwarding just a little bit, after the working group is done, sometimes we want to enhance this. And so we create these task groups, for example, 802.11a, and we use these letters, these lowercase letters at the end of the specification in order to show that we're enhancing it in some way. And so we had 802.11a, and as we see up here, we've got 802.11b to talk about, 802.11g. And so there have been many, many enhancements over the years, but it all started with this original specification, 802.11. 802.11 was introduced, if we can believe it, all the way back in 1997. Yes, even in the 90s, we had wireless Ethernet networking. But as you might imagine, it was pretty limited. We had one megabit per second as an option. We had two megabits per second as an option. And that was it. <laughs> if we couldn't connect at two megabits per second, we'd connect at one. And that was as fast as it ever got. We also used different types of what we call spread spectrum technologies. So we had frequency hopping spread spectrum and we had direct sequence spread spectrum. And so we're going to be talking about these concepts in more details here later on in this course, but understand that we don't actually use these techniques anymore. In fact, it didn't even take that long for us to move on from those techniques. Within a couple of years, in 1999, we actually had ourselves a much better wireless protocol. We had 802.11a. 802.11a was a significant step forward in technology. In fact, one might argue it was too big of a step. One of the biggest things that it did was it only worked in the 5 gigahertz space. See, even back in 1997, when we looked at 802.11, this was a 2.4 gigahertz only technology. And the 2.4 gigahertz space was already crowded. And so the idea was, let's get out of the 2.4 gigahertz space. Let's jump into 5 gigahertz land. However, this 5 gigahertz hardware that was available at the time was very expensive. And sometimes, even though a technology can be better, if the price isn't right, it's never going to get adopted. Now, on the plus side, 802.11a did migrate us away from these technologies, FHSS and DSSS, and it introduced the concept of OFDM, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. Again, we'll cover this in more details later, but ultimately this was a better way of doing communications to the point that we were able to get up to 54 megabits per second by leveraging it as well as the various modulation and encoding schemes that come along with it. And so this is a huge enhancement. I mean, yeah, it costs more money, but we were getting up to 54 megabits per second rather than the two megabits per second that was available with 802.11. But unfortunately for us, in a lot of situations, price is usually the biggest driver towards making decisions. And as a result, 802.11a saw remarkably little adoption. Now we'll say, yeah, it was expensive, but another reason why it didn't get very well adopted was shortly after 802.11a came out, we had another option. We had 802.11b. 802.11b wasn't nearly as fast as 802.11a. For example, it still used DSSS, and therefore the speed didn't really improve that much. We supported one and two megabits per second, for example, for backwards compatibility, but we only also supported five and a half and 11 megabits per second. So our best bet here was to get 11 megabits per second. And yeah, that's significantly less than 54, but it's still a big increase over the original 802.11. Now, furthermore, it also used the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And as I just mentioned, we're supporting these older rates for the purposes of backwards compatibility. And this is what really drove 802.11b's adoption. The fact that it was backwards compatible with 802.11, the original 802.11, brought about what we call investment protection. I had already probably purchased a whole bunch of 802.11 clients. And so all of these laptop cards that I was probably physically installing into these older types of slots, uh, all of these cards 
would have had to be upgraded to go to 802.11a. I couldn't use the same cards here. However, I could use the same cards if I moved my access points to 802.11b. And because of this, I could install brand new access point infrastructures and I could slowly upgrade my wireless cards and my wireless clients in order to achieve the better throughputs. So ultimately, it was the backwards compatible nature along with the much lower price point of 802.11b that brought about the low adoption of 802.11a. Now lastly here in our discussion, we have 802.11g. If you're wondering what happened to 802.11c, for example, well, these letters are not just used to enhance our wireless specifications, you know, the actual Wi-Fi generational increases. The IEEE was constantly making new task groups that brought other enhancements to the 802.11 specification. And so, yeah, at first it was all about just improving the generation. That's why we ended up with A and B right here. However, by the time we were ready to increase the generation again, we'd already had all these other working groups formed. So we didn't have C or D or E or F available. And so this is why we land with 802.11G. Now 802.11G came about in 2003. So it was a few years after 802.11A, and it basically sealed the deal where, okay, we're just done with deploying 802.11A because it bridged the gap between B and A by delivering the same technologies into the 2.4 gigahertz space. So at this point, we are using OFDM, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing, which again, gives us the ability to support up to 54 megabits per second. And once again, this is the big deal, it is backwards compatible. And so once again, we can have the same conversation. I don't have to upgrade all of my 802.11b clients. Instead, I can install 802.11g access points and slowly upgrade my 802.11 and 802.11b cards to 802.11g. And so we can also support the one and the two and the five and a half and the 11 megabits per second that was running here on 802.11b via DSSS. But naturally, if I'm talking to an 802.11g client, I'm going to use OFDM and all of the data rates that it supports. So 54 megabits per second. But if we need to step down, we also have other options. We could go to 48 megabits per second or 36, 24, and so on and so forth. So OFDM really introduces a whole bunch of different data rates that we can use depending on how high of a quality of signal that we have. The higher the SNR that we have with our client, the higher the throughput that we can use. This higher throughput largely comes from an improvement in our modulation techniques that we can use. We can use better modulation techniques if we have higher SNRs, and we're going to go into a whole lot of detail about <laughs> what that means and how these modulation techniques work later on in this course. Now that said, one thing to keep in mind moving forward is that we need to distinguish between bandwidth and throughput. A bandwidth is the raw data rate. So when we're talking about 48 and 36 and 24, and of course the 54 megabits per second, this is bandwidth. I might get 54 megabits per second as my raw data rate. However, throughput in the wireless space is going to be significantly less than that because we have to worry about things like interference and what we're calling the clear channel assessment and having to take turns talking, for example, as well as things like retransmits when a packet doesn't go through because it's wireless and it's not as reliable. All of these add up to the fact that our throughput's going to be less. And so a 54 megabit per second connection would often get us maybe 20 or 22 megabits per second of real throughput. So as I'm downloading a file, for example, I'm going to see them downloading it at this rate even though I have a 54 megabit per second connection. This is going to hold true even in modern Wi-Fi. Our bandwidth is always going to be much higher than our throughput, largely thanks to the unreliability of wireless communications. All right, so we've looked at four different 802.11 specifications. Let's just quickly walk through each one. Uh, this original 802.11 specification, it supported one and two megabits per second and it operated in the 2.4 gigahertz space. Yeah, then we had the 802.11a uh, enhancement. 802.11a brought 54 megabits per second, a huge step up thanks to OS OFDM. But the problem is that it operated in the five gigahertz space, which is more expensive, and it wasn't backwards compatible with what was already out there. And so enter in 802.11b. 802.11b is you know in the 2.4 gigahertz space again, so it improves what we had with our original 802.11 specification up to 11 megabits per second because of the backwards compatible nature, as well as the cheaper hardware, that is what got adopted more so than 802.11a. Now, lastly, we decided, hey, okay, it's great that clearly we wanna stay in the 2.4 gigahertz space. Let's bring all of these enhancements into 802.11g. 
So 802.11g is LFDM, 54 megabits per second, but it's in, it's in the 2.4 gigahertz space and therefore it's backwards compatible. And as a result of this, 802.11g was a standard that we stuck, a, stuck around for a long time. We continued to use 802.11g for a long time, and that's why we can expect as wireless engineers to still see 802.11g devices out there today. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.